There is a motion to dismiss the case against Coinbase, which is brought about by the SEC. And the real question is, does this play into a part of the Bitcoin ETF started by BlackRock as they chose Coinbase as their custodian? So this really all came about. There was a little show that we like to do called NFA Live. And uh, it's me, Ben, and a uh, guy from Coin Bureau. And we're just we're talking about some things you can see. Uh, guy is uh, has upgraded his green screen. He's now matching me. That's fine. Ben there is uh, laughing at all the altcoin investors. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, what we talked about uh, when Guy asked the question, he said, because I am not a believer that the Bitcoin ETF uh, is going to actually go through from BlackRock. And I'd made this many this this point many times. And and Guy asked me the question. He goes, Why? Why do you think that is? Uh, because, you know, you can't just say, like, I just don't think it is. There's a gut feeling. But I really broke it down. I said, I, there, there's something to be said about uh, BlackRock coming in and choosing Coinbase as their custodian, which they are uh, in direct uh, talks in an active lawsuit against the SEC. I just found it very odd. And I just kind of said, if, you know, if they wanted to make waves, that would be one of those ways to make waves and not really have a smooth ride to an approval of a Bitcoin ETF. But, you know, maybe that's in the past. So there was a, a report that came out. Uh, Paul Grunewell, he is the uh, legal counsel for Coinbase. And he put out a tweet and said, we asked them to dismiss the case itself. And here's what's going on. So they seek dismissal of the, of the, the case itself, claiming extraordinary abuse of processes. As Coinbase's legal team stated in the filing that even if the SEC were correct that the assets and services it identifies are within the scope of its existing regulatory authority, this legal action must be dismissed on independent grounds that it violates Coinbase's due process rights and constitutes an extraordinary abuse of process. Basically saying that you cannot regulate you cannot go in there and just decide and pick winners and say, this is secure, this is, a, this is not a security. Basically, you are not enforcing the law, you are writing the law. And I thought it was interesting because it's like the timing of what's going on right now. And if this goes through, because you know the, uh, the judge is gonna have to you know, confer with uh, different sides and ask them you know, different questions and go through it. If maybe the SEC doesn't put up much of a fight and goes, uh, you know, you know, this, this may be true or, or this may be, or they're just not as aggressive. Maybe this case does get dismissed. Now I am not an attorney. I do not dabble in, in, the, in the legal ramifications. I have lawyers for that. But when I take a look at this, I'm just saying, man, it's just an odd timing right now for this ETF. And if they do get dismissed, I think there's a higher probability that then that Bitcoin ETF will go through because now Coinbase is not in a legal tussle with the SEC. And that, lead me to my next thought, which was I we were talking about this on the show about ETFs and how things were doing. And I, I made a, a comment. I said, you know, in all honesty, you know, if you look at the ETFs historically, it hasn't been, been a great ride, especially for futures ETFs. And this is moving moving forward from all the way from October 2021 to uh, the present. And as far as we can see is like uh, the different futures ETF here in the States, you can just see that they've been hitting the tops and just kind of crashing everything. And, and whether that be the futures ETF or some other type of uh, ancillary factor or a black swan event, whatever else it is, but it is uncanny that just the actual futures ETFs, so you can see here, this was ProShares Bitcoin futures ETF or BitTo. Uh, the price, they started this at 64,000. That was essentially the top right there. And then uh, Van Eck Bitcoin Futures, that was on the 10th of November, 65,000. The other one, Valkyrie Bitcoin Futures on 26th October. Basically what they were doing is, I mean, they got in at, the, at that time. Uh, who knows, they were shorting or whatever else, but that's what the futures uh, contract can do as far as ETFs. They can short those things. Then the next one, <clears throat> as far as uh, futures, you had ProShares where it was a short Bitcoin ETF and that started at 20,700. Did pretty good there because it went down to 15,000. So Congratulations to you. And the latest one is the Volatility Shares Futures Double X Leverage Bitcoin ETF. I don't know how the heck that got approved, but here we are. There's Gary protecting everybody by allowing leverage. So fantastic. We'll see how that one uh, plays out. But never forget, uh, the most famous Bitcoin Futures ETF was on 17th of December 2017. And the top of the last cycle, which was 15th of December 2017, was 19,665. And two days later, the CBOE Bitcoin features launched and it pretty much crashed everything for a couple of years because uh, they were there to, as they quote unquote say, to tame Bitcoin. However, 
I had to take a look at the Bitcoin spot ETFs. Now, those aren't in America, but uh, for the data that we have, mostly we're in Canada. And you can just see that, in all honesty, uh, it did pretty well. So the ones that I can take a look at was uh, 18th of February, 2021. Canada had two, Purpose Bitcoin Spot and Evolver ETF on 19th of February, 2021, when the price was 51000 And of course, we topped out at around 67, 68000 So pretty good one there. And then we had one on uh, the 8th of March, 2021. That was Galaxy Digital. They got in at 52000 So pretty good. 3IQ Bitcoin Spot, 15th of March, 55000 And then, uh, then we have one over here. 30th of June, 2022, the Canada, this is the uh, Fidelity Bitcoin spot ETF at 19,006 weight, looking pretty good at 30,000. So um, in all honesty, if we take a look at uh, between futures and spot, futures was awful, but spot, not too bad. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. Hopefully I am wrong. We do get that approved. But there was another thing that, another question that came up on NFA Live, and I want to correct my statements. So the question was, uh, you know, what do we think about uh, Ethereum developers? Uh, they want to raise uh, the maximum validate limit from 32 to 2048. The way I read this one was I thought that it was the minimum. They were raising the minimum from 32 to 2048. And I got to tell you, uh, if you were here to stake Ethereum or, or, or whatnot, um, I think this is a pretty good idea. Uh, because if you, can have, if you can have a range of a minimum of 32 ETH to become a validator, great or you can maximize that out to 2048. I think this is a great play, and then it will kind of free up a lot of resources and make things a little bit easier. The only thing I can see as this uh, not being the greatest thing is that if you are uh, one of those, if you're a validator and then you're, you're staking and it's 2000 uh, ETH for that one, you have a, a slashing uh, incident uh, where they slash the different rewards, that could be a big thing. But for me, I will uh, retract my, my comment. I think this is actually a good thing if they can you know, do this. Now, then you don't have validators of 32, 32, 32 all over the place. And the big guys can come in and kind of like secure uh, the network with their 2048 or, or a small business can do something or a, a recent individual could uh, stake 32 ETH. So that to me looks pretty good. And that's what we talked about. And then lastly, uh, before we move on to some, some uh, negative news, uh, guy asked the question about Fed now on NFA live. And of course I will link this in the description. But the FedNow service, if you don't know, it's not a CBDC, but it is $25 per month. And uh, I talk about why I would do it. I know it sounds kind of odd coming from a person who dabbles in, in crypto and, and gets into it, but I explain why uh, because of fees and things like that for, for different transactions as far as a merchant and my online businesses. Uh, 25 bucks a month is uh, peanuts, quite honestly. But there was a part I didn't get to, to talk about. And why I wanted to share this with everybody is because I know how we think that these, these huge corporations and entities and banks are able to do pretty much magically everything and they can really make things uh, you know, either easy or difficult for us and that they're, they're like the all-knowing things and, and they have so many resources and they can just you know, crush us. Not so. Because when I was taking a look at this, this FedNow service, <clears throat> in America we have uh, PayPal and Zelle and Cash App and, and a couple others that we, we can do, you know, peer-to-peer -peer transactions with cash. And it's almost instantaneous. And uh, the one that I looked up, I was talking about was Zelle. And Zelle is interesting because of this article right here. Zelle, if you don't know, it doesn't actually make any money. It was actually a consortium of banks. And it was actually first branded as Clear Exchange. This is in 2011. It was owned by Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and JP Morgan. It was slow, took up to five days of transfer, only a few banks were participating, blah, blah, blah. In 2016, they sold it off. I mean, these big banks, these big entities that have done a ton of things and you know, have all these resources, and they couldn't get it right. They sold it off to Early Warning Services, which is owned by a bunch of banks. And after that, they pretty much made Zelle what it is today. I think they have over you know, thousands of different banks that are connected. Again, it works out pretty well because the different banks get uh, the funds through the different transactions. They don't really make any money per se. It is able to connect the banks. So when we think about these, like, the, you know, JP Morgan can do so many things, they couldn't even get this right. So um, um, I will just say innovation is better for the small industries, the small startups, the small businesses, because you don't have layers and layers and layers of people that you have to report to, and you actually get stuff done. So I think you think about that in the comment section. That was just an interesting story. You know, if you start to think about, oh, you know, these banks can do everything. They can't.
kind of suck at stuff. And then lastly, I uh, will just say this. This is from, from a friend of the show, Dan Gamardello from Crypto. I would say it's Crypto Recruiter, but that's just his handle. He's got a great uh, YouTube show. You should check it out. Is doing really good coverage on what's going on with Cardano and the ecosystem, which is right now crushing it. And what this is, if you can believe it, is uh, looks like FTX is relaunching. I can't believe it either. And uh, I just thought it was amazing how our market operates and how we do these things. And uh, let's see what happens. But what's amazing to me is, <clears throat> I want to remember this, is that just because the price goes up doesn't mean it's a great product. doesn't mean it's going to make it. It's just that there's some gamblers out there. Look at this. Over the last uh, 14 days, the price of FTT, which is the uh, token for FTX, went from 87 cents all the way to $2. $2. So I don't know what's going on with our market, but apparently that's the people that's in it. And if you're here to make money, I can't fault you. It just seems ridiculous, but that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I don't care who you subscribe to, just get your information from somebody that you trust and actually like to listen to. But that's it. I do appreciate you stopping by and I'll see you guys on the next one.